So I really am a practicing physician, uh, internist, and gastroenterologist, and I was out there, I had to run out because I have a patient with abdominal pain um, who I'm sending to the Brigham right now, who is in the, in the Brigham emergency room right now. And uh, as a cautionary tale about, because we're going to be talking about data and genomics and maybe p putting your life on the line for information, um, I, I uh, talked into Siri to say, I have to moderate a panel, signing off, have to moderate a panel. It translates Siri change to moderate into timid erase. <laughs> so this leads me to a discussion about data, how much we trust it, what we can learn from it, uh, and also what the error rate is as we're looking about these, you know, big genomic pro uh, projects and, and telling people that they have this abnormality or that abnormality, but maybe, maybe is it to moderate or is it timid or race? And how much, and I can look at that and say, oh, no, 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 that was just wrong. Uh, but who's going to be looking at that data at a, at a granular level to tell us maybe, oh, that, was, that codon was wrong or that, uh, that little, that's, that that's, it wasn't an A, that was a C uh, in the genome. So with that, let's just, um, we, we decided we're going to go across and just, um, Starting over there and coming here, well, uh, we're going to identify yourself, um, say a little spiel about what you do, and then we're going to try to get, we're going to try to go rogue a little bit, and the idea is going to be we've, we've all had a couple of beers, we're at the bar, and we're just talking about, like, what would be amazing stuff, and that's, and that's going to be kind of like the feel of, of this discussion. Okay, well, I'm Sean Harper. I'm head of research and development at Amgen uh, in, in California. Um, and we're engaged in uh, a variety of activities uh, that are directed at discovering new uh, targets, particularly for uh, grievous illnesses. And uh, some of the ways we do that is to actually focus in population genetics. Uh, we acquired uh, decode uh, genetics in Iceland and use that platform to help us with the discovery and uh, validation and invalidation of drug targets. I'm Jeff Gulcher. I'm the CSO of uh, Wuxi Nexcode Genomics, uh, which is a spin out of Amgen and Decode. Um, I was formerly a CSO and co-founder of Decode Genetics. And what we do is we take the informatics systems that we developed over the last 18 years at Decode and try to uh, take that database architecture and tools and make them available for non-decode people, uh, and uh, whether they're medical institutions or pharmaceutical companies or big population projects. I'm Mark Fishman, president of the Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research. My background, a cardiologist and developmental geneticist. I'm David Altshuler. Uh, I spent 20 years at Mass General and the Broad Institute doing human genetics research, and a few months ago moved to Vertex as chief scientific officer. So you have a coming together of lots of different worlds, as we're seeing in the audience and here. We have software, we have patients, we have genomics, we have a lot of, now how do they all mix together? And Sean, I want to talk with you. I know we, we don't want to, I promise we wouldn't spend too long on Iceland, but I'm so fascinated by that. If you could um, st just give an example, we wanted to give an example of the thing that jazzed you up the most, something that's happening right now that lights you up. Can you talk? Talk about that with, with Iceland in, in mind, and the, the example of the, the two girls, I, I, I just love that. Yeah, I will, well, actually, Jeff can talk about that particular example better than I will, but uh, I'd say that th the thing that's so amazing and so exciting in what's happening in Iceland is that, as Jeff mentioned, for 18 years there's been an attempt to be able to really correlate um, the genetic variation that's observed in a very large sample of patients there with disease risk. And this is how you know, we can begin to understand what targets might be relevant to develop drugs against. But it was exceedingly difficult to do this without getting down to the single nucleotide level, to being able to read those A's and C's and G's you were talking about. And that only became possible just you know, in a matter of a few years ago, at the, at the scale that's necessary, we're talking now hundreds of thousands of individuals. Iceland is, is unique in many ways. Um, the, the, the founder population there, the knowledge of the relatedness of the people on the island allow for us to extrapolate information from a patient who has been sequenced into those who have not. And so we're able to amplify the, the sequencing information in a way that's very powerful. And so, you know, we've been amazed at the learnings that have come um, from, for the first time in history, being able to see 
the entire you know, three billion base pairs in a single individual at scale in thousands of individuals where we have very detailed information about uh, their, their health and, and disease state. And that's just historic. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a historic event. So Jeff, give us an amuse-bouche, uh, amuse-arbouche about, with a specific example, because some people may know what we're talking about with Iceland, some people sure. not. But give, it, give the example that you gave me about sure. how this might specifically help. Because I think it is, it is both exciting and a cautionary tale right. in terms of some of the bioethics, some of the ethical issues that it's going to raise. Right. Right. You mean in terms of the two girls? In terms of the, the two girls, but sure. then in terms of other sure. information okay. you happen to find out and what that means for our efforts right here. Sure. We're having, you know, we, we, were, we have a, uh, Francis Collins saying we're going to take a million people and we're going to get their entire genome yeah. sequence and then we're going to see what happens. Sure. There are some questions that we need to answer. So about three, three and a half years ago, there was a family whose children had a neurological disease undiagnosed and they approached Kari, the physician and the family approached Kari to engage in whole genome sequencing for the whole family. And these were two girls who were born completely normal. Uh, they lived to about age five before they developed some hearing difficulty and some visual difficulty. So initially everybody's thinking of Usher syndrome type genes. They were tested for all those known Mendelian forms of, uh, of both hearing and visual uh, difficulties. Then within about a year, they also started developing some ALS type uh, features. They had some facial weakness. They also eventually developed some respiratory uh, diaphragmatic weakness as well. Uh, and the constellation of clinical features overlap, but it wasn't exactly uh, something that was called Van Leer syndrome. It's a, uh, a known recessive disorder caused by mutations in a riboflavin transporter gene. They, of course, were tested by, uh, for that, those specific genes as well, uh, and, but they continued to progress without a diagnosis and therefore a treatment uh, for another two or three years before they, uh, before Kari, um, was, was, they approached Kari. And he sequenced the parents and the children, whole genome sequenced. And within five minutes using the informatic systems that we had developed at DECODE, uh, we found that the, the, both children had a double mutation uh, within, they both share that rare mutation. The parents were carriers following, following a recessive model. And it was in the sister gene of the known riboflavin transporter gene, uh, this paralog gene. And uh, so, of course, we were all excited, and you know, this must be the, the cause, and you know, this also suggests the treatment. Uh, but we also wanted to replicate it, right? And within uh, another 10 minutes or so, we were able to identify two other families whose parents carried the exact same mutation, and based on the medical records, had children who died by early adolescence, which unfortunately is the natural history of this uh, syndrome. So the doctors put, them on, put the patients on high dose riboflavin supplementation to try to compensate for this weaker riboflavin transporter gene. And over the last three years since that treatment, they have not progressed at all. Now, they didn't reverse whatever deficits they had, but they have not progressed, suggesting that uh, this has been life-saving treatment based on identifying a new gene within this po population of Iceland. And of course, I had to ask, uh, being the eternal optimist, were they able to find anybody like three years old or two years old who had the defect but hadn't yet developed any symptoms yeah, not, and the not answer so, was not so far. no. Yeah. But that just blew me away because going back to the first um, the discussion that we had, when you're talking about different models of disease and the fact that we used to say breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, now you're looking at a genetic defect. You don't even, you haven't even descri described a syndrome yet. Right. And you're picking it out and saying it's similar to that, like the orphan disease right. thing that we're talking about. How might this change our the way we even think about disease. And we're right now, our categorization, we say ALS, Parkinson's, MS, Alzheimer's. How could this possibly change the way we, or can it change the way we even think about disease? Well, we've already there for cancer, of course. Right. So, so I'll tell you a story. When I started at Novartis, they said to me soon after I arrived that they wanted a strategy. And I had no idea what a strategy was because I'd came from Harvard. <laughs> um, but I had, they had asked me to spend a few months at the Harvard Business School. This was, I think, a buyer's remorse kind of an issue <laughs> after they'd hired me. And I learned, and this, by the way, is free. Any of you want to know how you can start your own consulting firm? I've told a couple of people this. 
all you have to do when you're asked for a strategy is to have a two by two chart. It doesn't matter what the axes are. You have to be in the upper right corner. <laughs> so when they asked me for a strategy, I said, well, you had to pick an unmet medical need and have something that was scientifically tractable. No, of course, no, no, no finances in there. And what's interesting is if you think about what's in the upper right corner there, it's genetic disorders, rare genetic disorders, where you actually know what the disease is. It's rare, it's usually untreated. The vast majority have no treatment. Uh, and uh, you have at least a pathway that's involved. Uh, so we started on a, a series of, of those kinds of disorders and it's been very fruitful. And the reason we did was because we felt, as you're Im implying, that, that if you had the pathway you tested it in a genetic disorder. You could do it in a few patients. The first one we did was uh, Muckle-Well syndrome. A show of hands for those of you who know what Muckle-Well syndrome is. It's not a lot, there you go. Because it's an interleukin-1 dependent syndrome, we had an interleukin-1 antibody. Traditionally would have tested in rheumatoid arthritis, which of course is a very heterogeneous disease. This is a disease, a genetic disease that's too much interleukin-1. It worked in the first four patients. The first patient never had a good night's rest in her life and now had. So we, and then you could expand from there to other disorders of the same pathway, in this case, gout or even potentially atherosclerosis. So for me, the genetic definition of disease is, uh, as opposed to the phenotypic definition, uh, gives you a starting point, which you often don't have if you go into the broad diseases you're ultimately interested in, and it gives you uh, an approach that allows you to get quickly registered with new medicine and then to expand to subsets of populations that have these uh, much more common diseases. So right now, how does that make you think differently, if it does, about the wisdom of how we're approaching these neuro neurocognitive disorders? So the, uh, so the clear problem with the neurocognitive disorders is that none of them, be they autism or depression or schizophrenia, by themselves are a single disorder. In fact, we don't even know that one case of depression is more closely allied to another case of depression than it is to schizophrenia, and I'm sure David can out tell you more about the genetics of that as well. They share. So for us, the key here, the opening, the explosion, the opportunity is that we'll be able to define, hopefully, sets of these uh, neurocognitive disorders that share pathways and then devise treatments for them. Of course, you have to couple that with systems which we can talk about, induce pluripotential cells and others, but you have, for the first time, an ability to define a disease based on a genotype. The phenotype is what messes us up, and that's what the big problems are. I'm gonna to turn to David, but after David has his, does a little spiel, what I really want a green light is everybody coming in. It doesn't have to be, I'm not, I'm not the spoke in the middle of the, of the wheel. If you ask each other questions, come back, anybody wanna shout something out, I'm gonna look at the iPad. Let's have a real robust discussion as you have questions about he's saying, interrupt, all that stuff. So I think that'll be, fun. So, so I, I want to make two points <clears throat> the, about what we've just talked about. The first is that we need to understand that simply being able to diagnose what's going on in terms of the underlying pathway does not the vast majority of the time lead to an intervention. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the discussions that get had about this whole area always have the flavor of we looked, we found it, we, we, we compressed the entire process, which I'm gonna talk about in a second, of discovering a new medicine that actually helps patients, which is really a 25 year endeavor, right. and actually somehow compresses it down to 10 minutes, just to tease Jeff, that somehow we look, we find the patient, and then we know what to do, there's an existing medicine or whatever. I think that's very rarely going to be the case. And so what we really need to think about is when we identify an underlying pathway or a set of patients who would benefit, and on the assumption that most of the time there isn't a medicine in hand, mm -hmm. what does the process look like to get one? Right. And that's where actually I think what is very exciting is we're seeing progress and some of the people here could describe specific examples. I could talk about the work done by Vertex and others. But the key thing is there's a process of years which is simply to understand most of the time the gene won't be labeled as the sister gene and we know what to do. So we need to have a process usually done by academics uh, sometimes done in companies to understand that process. Then there's actually an effort, usually three to five years, done typically by companies to discover a therapeutic that could actually intervene. And then there's the five to eight years of clinical trials, regulatory, commercial, et cetera, to get it to patients. And I think that one of the things, just to close on this, that I 
uh, think is both very motivating, but also part of the story that Jeff Lyden and others talked about that we hadn't told yet to the public, is that it truly is a long path. And that we shouldn't expect from the President's Precision Medicine Initiative or from Decode or from anything, that we're gonna get a, a therapy a six months, a year, even five years later. And yet the flip side is that we're willing to spend the 10 or 20 years to actually understand and develop a therapeutic, you can get actually quite miraculous advances. So it's a long path, but is that path configured the same way as it used to be? Do we need to think differently about how we get from here to there? Or is it just more better? Of, like we'll do it the way we used to. I think it's gonna take a very similar length of time. But how about similar partnerships? And I mean, you've got very well, partnerships unusual collaborations. Can, but let, let, uh, let me amplify. No, I'm not sure it's different. And because it's what I think what Dave said very sagely is that it's the fundamental biological process we have to understand, not the gene. You know, there's. I, I just looked into this. I looked at the the uh, the, the top uh, few dozen. Uh, drugs that are used today, mm -hmm. friend. I look from when the, the fundamental discovery was made to when the drug was approved. And the vast majority of them are 30 years. And we knew right at the beginning, for example, that angiotensin converting enzyme was going to be in a hypertension, but it just took a long and winding path. So maybe it'll be 20, maybe it'll be 30. But you know, I think there's a very important understanding of fundamental biology. You know, if you find all the genes that are in depression or linked to synaptic formation, great, but that's Pretty, right. pretty uh, primitive starting point. So, and I think the, 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 the implication that's so important is that we just have to keep supporting the fundamental science, which has to be done in academia. And I thought the point that was being made by Peter Slavin and the others right. previously, it's incredibly important because it is, that it requires a world's effort. Yeah, and I think just one point that, that is key is um, that people often uh, look to calibrate you know, how fast we can do this process. But I actually think the key is actually to have a higher success rate, mm -hmm. which is different than going faster. In fact, one could argue that one of the reasons the success rate has fallen is because of all the attention to increasing numbers and trying to make it go faster. Because fundamentally, if you don't understand what you're doing, which can only be sped up so much, if you don't develop the best therapy, you try and make that go faster, if you don't do the trials right, you won't end up succeeding. I think that the real challenge in development of interventions, whether they be behavioral or, or, therapy or uh, drugs or whether they, medicines or whether they be uh, devices, is um, do we make it so that when something goes into the patient, it actually succeeds more often than it succeeds today? And that is all about understanding the biology, being able to avoid on-target toxicities and off-target toxicities rather than uh, that it's going to, again, magically be the mix, just sort of the matching of the gene to something off the shelf. So at the fear of having people glaze over, I want to go micro and macro, and I want to get your question. Is it, go, let me have your question first. Go. Well, I was going to, I was going to uh, amplify what Mark and David were talking about with, if you talk about understanding the biology, yes, uh, as Mark mentioned, you can try to define all the synaptic uh, proteins, but what genetics does for you is it allows you to focus, focus your attention just on a smaller number, I don't know if it's a handful or still a large number, but allows you to focus your attention on those rate limiting pathways or networks or whatever you want to call them, and it gives you an opportunity of condensing this, this, uh, this R&D. Now, it still may take 20 or 30 years, right, even just go, what, but I think what uh, David uh, uh, mentioned is maybe we can improve the success rate. We don't know that for sure, right? There's been some handful of successes, but I think it'll be interesting to see how, how it is in the long term. So, to, again, thinking about the people who are in the audience, can you give us some of your thoughts about uh, genome versus transcript? For wh where, where is it? Where's the interesting yeah. stuff? Where's, what does your nose tell you? What do the hairs on the back of your neck tell you? I think the example we heard, obviously, from, uh, uh, from Biogen just at, at the last uh, session, just imagine the time course that it's been taking to look at the, the beta amyloid uh, story, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So Selco and others have been arguing with the rest of us over the years, uh, amyloid is the key, right? But others would argue that, no, this is just simply a reaction to neuronal death, right? And so, you know, what is it? Is it the protein level? Is it the RNA level? Or is it the gene? And then the Swedish, uh, muta the Swedish mutation in the gene that makes amyloid was found in 1990. And that, that was tied to early onset Alzheimer's. And so, aha, it looks like this is a cause of at least some subform of Alzheimer's disease. So now let's try to attack that amyloid uh, uh, with, with a variety of different uh, agents. And all those were unsuccessful until recently. 
And uh, some were suggesting that, well, maybe we can only treat the early onset form of Alzheimer's that have the Swedish mutation with these antibodies, uh, and otherwise we won't get any effect. But then uh, Decode and, and Kari, about four years ago, did a large-scale study, looking at almost 300,000 uh, Icelanders with whole genome sequence data, looked for a protective variant in the context of Alzheimer's. They simply looked at APOE4 carriers. They are at high risk for Alzheimer's. What is it that neutralizes that risk in elderly Icelanders who are cognitively intact despite being 80 or 90 years old? What is the, and that was the mechanism, that was the, that was the, uh, uh, the study that led to the identification of the first uh, protective variant for Alzheimer's. And, and what gene was that? It was in the amyloid producing a gene, uh, APP. And so, and then together with Genentech, they demonstrated that it was decreasing the, ba the bad amyloid. The Swedish mutation would increase the bad amyloid. And so you had sort of the yin and yang of that gene predicting, yes, indeed, you can actually prevent Alzheimer's or, or decrease Alzheimer's if you were to attack the amyloid. And the relative risk for this protective variant was not just 20% or 30%, we're talking talk, decrease in uh, risk. 13. It was seven-fold decrease risk. So it suggests, and it wasn't just for early onset Alzheimer's, the subform that APP had been initially considered uh, against, it's for even the late onset, the common forms of Alzheimer's. So here you have an opportunity of going from a very specific finding in a subset of patients mm -hmm. and expanding it, uh, as Mark mentioned, to other, uh, other uh, a broader phenotype and Maybe that's what, why we see, finally, a successful treatment that Biogen had recently uh, for Alzheimer's with their attack on amyloid. Sean, when you hear that, what goes through, what goes through your head? <laughs> well, I'm, you know, very familiar with the work that uh, Jeff is, is describing, um, and as is, uh, as is David. And, and I think, you know, what, what it illustrates is that we are able to um, use information like this to, again, focus our priorities in what, in what we do. Because, you know, we have the potential um, to work on many different things. And we have a lot of animal models and a lot of, um, of, of descriptive data of humans that um, can lead us to be interested in particular um, uh, pathways and, and particular drug targets. But to have this kind of information that comes directly from humans, mm -hmm. Um, and, and allows you to say, yes, I, I can have a high degree of confidence that that drug target is actually relevant to this disease in humans, right? That's, that's worlds away from what we're doing in the old paradigm. The, the, the old paradigm, you know, this, this may not sound uh, like it gives you 100% confidence in your success, because it doesn't. But when you compare it to the absence of any human validating information, and all you're really doing, right, is mucking around with, you know, with rodent models that diverged evolutionarily from us 65 million years ago, that's big progress. And so any time that you can get a convincing, a really convincing story like the one that Jeff just told you, it can give you a much higher uh, degree of confidence and, in a target, and, and that's critical. And I think that, that it, ways in which it's critical are not are two things. One is, uh, again, hopefully leading to a higher level of success, but the other is simply that the organization feels confident investing and committing for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. And so giving the example of, of for a minute of cystic fibrosis, again done by my colleagues at Vertex before I joined, uh, but uh, 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 is, uh, you know, the, the, I, the genetic cause of cystic fibrosis identified 25 some years ago. And actually as a young geneticist and physician, you would always hear, well, we know that, we know that gene, but where's the therapy, right? But meanwhile, people in academia were working hard, committed to understanding, so there was no doubt that mutations in this gene were causing the disease. And so people worked and figured out what did the protein do and what were the defects in different mutations and they classified the different mutations according to what was wrong. So scientists at, at, at Vertex, um, in really a really remarkable partnership with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, a patient advocacy group, um, invested for many, many years in developing assays in the laboratory, experiments in the laboratory that faithfully recapitulate the biology of the patient's underlying defect. And then developing new medicines that initially didn't, you know, they're just 
early leads. You have to optimize them. You have to get them so they could be safe and effective therapeutics. Doing the clinical trials, this goes on for 15 years. If you weren't confident, this was not an easy project. This was a very challenging project. And if it was just one of hundreds of targets that each had some weak backing behind them, then you probably would end up with this, with you know, people quitting early or not getting there. But when you actually have this confidence and people work for that long because they're so sure that that underlying uh, defect is relevant to patients, what you end up with are, is not only uh, medicines that really for the first time in this case, and there are other examples others could tell, really make a big difference for families, but you also have a process of developing those medicines that now, at least in these hands, not failing you know, 20, 98% of the time or 95% of the time, but succeeding multiple times when they go into the clinic because a true translational process has been built. But that took 15 years. So if you weren't convinced, if you weren't committed, you probably wouldn't take that period of time. So I want to broaden it out, and then we can focus back down again with specific examples. But we all know a little over 10 years ago, it cost 400 million bucks to sequence the entire human genome. That now came down to, it's come down to close to $1,000. And last week, we heard a company announced that for the low, low price of $249, you can get BRC1, BRC2, and 17 other genes that are linked to breast cancer and ovarian cancer in unclear ways. As we're getting more and more genomic information on everybody, and as we're talking about getting the sequences of a million Americans, how are you thinking about that in terms of, from a business point of view, in terms of opportunities, in terms of risks, in terms of how to interpret the data, uh, and in terms of issues like came up in Iceland when they accidentally, find, well, they incidentally find out that there's a certain number of people who have BRCA1, which increases the risk of, uh, BRCA2, increases the risk of breast and, and, uh, and ovarian cancer, but half of those women hadn't been tested for it by their doctors. Now what do you do? Do you tell them? Do you not tell them? So uh, I'm asking very easy questions, so why don't, why don't you just uh, give it a try, Sean? Well, uh, I think with, with your latter question, you know, this is an area that uh, has really um, plagued, uh, you know, research on human subjects for many, many years, um, and particularly genetics research. But uh, there are many examples where um, populations are explicitly consented in such a way that it is made clear that the information is for research purposes only. It will not be returned to them. It will be not be returned to their physicians. And yet. Uh, because everybody feels that that's exactly the right thing to do. And then, uh, as happened, for example, in uh, one of the NIH studies where they were doing prostate biopsies on men, all of a sudden you've got all these prostate biopsies showing that people have cancer, and what do you do? And you know, you've gone and you, you know, th these, are, these are bioethical conundrums for us these days. I think you know, the pendulum is beginning to swing uh, toward a, a more open approach to these situations on a case-by-case -case basis going back and informing people, but that requires going through the appropriate ethical review boards and so on that have informed, you know, that, that, that uh, uh, gave the, the uh, informed consent uh, review in the first place because, you know, you can't, you know, inf have a conform consent agreement with somebody and then just violate it, you know. So it, these things are very, are, are very complex. And I think um, as we move along, uh, our society will come up with, you know, the practical kind of reasonable uh, solutions to them. I think, you know, there's no question that the availability of routine uh, genomic testing is something that we have to take into, uh, into account. Uh, for example, if we're going to develop a, pr a drug in a subset of a disease a state, um, you know, we, and we, we can identify those patients by genotyping, it has to be our assumption that by the time that drug gets to market, let's say in five to seven years, that it's going to have become a routine to test for that mutation because there'll be, you know, if there's a therapy available, you some look, at, look at something like hepatitis C. I mean, nobody used to test and screen patients for hepatitis C, but now it's standard practice to screen people for hepatitis C. And you're a hepatologist, so am I. You know, the, you know why we weren't doing it and why we do it now. Right. See, so there's, you know, the, the use of this kind of technology in the clinic is clearly going to take place. But it can be a little bit difficult to, to think through the landscape, you know, the payer reimbursement landscape and so on, five years, seven years, ten years down so, the road. So one way of looking at it, though, which I think is the best way to look at it myself, is 
to just look at the experience from the rest of medicine. As Mark said, it might not actually be that different a process. It might just, you know, for drug discovery. And I think it actually may not be that different for medicine. So I'm an endocrinologist by training, and there are lots of examples in endocrinology of there used to be severe diseases, like if you think about hyperparathyroidism, high calcium. There were very few people who had a very severe disease, and then you develop a way to inexpensively and routinely test calcium levels, and guess what? You pick up a bunch of people who have uh, you know, uh, lower levels of hyperparathyroidism, and you're not quite sure what to do, and then you have a consensus conference, and you figure it out, and in the end, you come up with the right algorithm. You have CAT scans, you have x-rays. I actually see the advent of this genomic information is pretty much just like yeah. the history of medicine. I think it's the genetic exceptionalism that is the real problem, is somehow suggesting we're in totally new waters and we're not sure what to do. The one thing that is exceptional, I would argue, about the genetic information is it goes all the way from the disease to the underlying biological root cause, okay? And that is very powerful for the kind of work that we're trying to do and others are trying to do, develop new, new therapies that have the potential not just to treat symptoms, but to actually modify the course of the disease because they're getting in to the underlying process. So I personally would argue as someone who spent 20 years actually sequencing genomes and before I moved to, the, mm -hmm. to, to developing therapies just a few months ago, um, that actually it is the biggest mistake that we can make is to suggest this is all brave new world and rather just go back to the clinical common sense of all the other types of floods of information that have come in and figure out how to have wisdom as to how we bring them, get the benefits while minimizing the risks. It's not a brave new world, but there are many more variables than there used to be. So what do you do with the data that Google is collecting or Apple is collecting at home? Uh, what do you do with that? The fact that somebody who has MS and is wearing a device that may find that they're a little unsteady, and that may be the first thing that you notice in terms of a flare, that we never had that information mm -hmm. before. And is, is that somehow rolled up? Can you learn something from looking at their genotype for those subsets of people who react a certain way to a certain drug. There's an interesting question apropos of that, which is if we could sequence all past clinical trial participants for failed neurodrugs, how many do you think could be found to have been successful for subgroups? You know, I think the big problem, and we've done some of this post hoc analysis, the big problem with it is the phenotyping. The assumption that you're, you know, if you have a, a Mendelian disease, you're in great shape. But if you don't, and you're taking a population at large, you're making a lot of assumptions, and so you need usually huge populations to be able to accommodate that kind of a, of a, of a different look. I don't think it, I, I, we've done this several times, yeah. it's been pretty unremarkable. It's, it's been done quite a bit. I think the key thing, myself, is that most diseases are not I would argue, simple Mendelian diseases that like, if someone says to you, I, I'll, I'll rely on something, that, like cystic fibrosis is a disorder where there's one gene mm -hmm. and, and it's caused by that. But type two diabetes, for example, a disease I worked on up until very recently, is not a collection of simple Mendelian. Someone might tell you it is, but we've done the experiment in my, you know, that the world, there have been tens of thousands of se people sequenced with type two diabetes. It doesn't divide into a pie chart with a hundred different single Mendelians. If that's the picture people have in their head, is that all the common diseases are going to neatly parse into a collection of simple diseases, they probably have a, a picture that doesn't map to reality. But on the other hand, if you say, can we learn about the pathways? Can we learn what interventions might be helpful? We can learn tremendously valuable things. It just won't be that each person has a simple form no, of what seems even, to be a Mendel, they say, probably threw out some of his uh, the, the, the problems, that, the characteristics that weren't on the same chromosome, right? Mm -hmm. They said that didn't make sense. So, but um, well, we all we're talking, and it's been a, across a couple of these seminars of these uh, panels about phenotype. So again, think I hate you know, keep going back to out of the box, um, but are there better ways of getting phenotype on the record? I mean, with all the devices that people sure. have, sure. Um, is it being done? Are people talking about yes. being done? So yeah, what's... I'm, yeah, I mean, I, you heard about it at the last panel as yeah. well, that there are devices, many of you are probably wearing them, which can monitor if you're, how much you're, sta how many stairs you're going up per day, mm -hmm. uh, whether you're sleeping, how you're, and they'll get fancier, and there's no question about that. But then, for example, and, and the advantage of that, as was said, is that you get a longitudinal cross-section over a long period of time, not a retrospective one when you plunk down in the doctor's office and they say, you know, how do you feel today? Um, but you can think about the diff that works very well for someone who is falling, perhaps, or mm -hmm. having, 
how do you analyze someone's uh, depression? How do you analyze uh, a young boy uh, with autism? Uh, when we were doing autism studies, it was very, very difficult. Parents want their kids to get better, so you have to analyze, are they looking at the parent? Now, this is all doable. And I think once we get those kinds of devices, it will not only change how we discover medicines, it will change who is in the hospital and who's not in the hospital, who's cared for at home. But also talk to Disney. And other, you know, the, you, you have these examples of people who are only able to relate Absolutely. to their kid through Absolutely. animated characters. Uh, and I mean, uh, that's what I'm trying to think yep. of. Are there, are there things that we just don't think of because we're scientists, you know, that, that could be helpful? I mean, w one example that, that I, I'm particularly uh, interested in is how we think about the informed consent process. So John Wilbanks, mm -hmm. who's done this very interesting work on uh, taking the paper, which is, or the computer screens that have the consent process that it, it's been shown very few people have the time and bandwidth to read them all, mm -hmm. you know, and you sign at the back, and actually has created web apps together with this, this group called Sage that actually have a phone and they use graphics and they use uh, little tests to try and actually make sure that people understand and they're trying to do this for some Parkinson's trials. I think some of the pieces that may seem that they need innovation are the high-tech pieces about sequencing genomes and managing Fitbits. And some of it could actually be the more routine pieces of this. For example, you know, getting back to Sean's comment about consent and how do we really make sure that the discussion that's being had between the medical center, the company, and the participant actually is understood by all parties. You know, uh, now, if you take the flip side of the phenotyping uh, question, what if you start with a genotype? Okay, you have a loss of function mutation affecting, okay. knocking out a gene, and you want to know something about that as an interesting pathway maybe for, for pharma to, to, or for somebody to, to, to uh, inquire about. Well, then you can take those patients who actually have that knocked out variant, right, in your population. Maybe there's five, maybe there's 20, maybe there's 30, and ask the question, what phenotypic data do they have in common with each other, right? So you can do a much more detailed phenotyping and ask the question, what is the function of this gene that's been knocked out? So Decode, uh, in their papers that they published uh, a few weeks ago in Nature Genetics, they did the first human knockout database who created that uh, by, once again, looking at the population of Iceland whole genome sequence data on over hundreds of thousands of patients and asked the question, if we go gene by gene, which of them have both copies knocked out? It's about 7% of the Icelandic population has, is, a, is a double knockout for at least one gene. And that covers at least, uh, I think, 1,200 genes in Iceland overall. And then, of course, there's even more people who are heterozygous for that loss of function of mutation. But here's a different paradigm. If you are willing to sequence a million Americans or, you know, 300,000 Qataris or whatever, you have the opportunity of going back in the other direction mm -hmm. and doing this well, extensive like phenotyping. That kind of That's right. Yeah, exactly. that double. Yeah. Yeah. What was the last thing? I want, I, I'm tempted to ask this in a cutesy way, but I won't. Like you're sending a spaceship out, Voyager, and you want to put something on it that just lit you up to tell the aliens out there that, look what we're doing here. But in a non-cutesy way, what was the last thing that, that lit you up and you came back and you said, you cannot, to your friends or your family, you said, you will not believe what, what's going on right now? Well, you know, I, I think, again, um, we, we've seen um, examples where we uh, find a very compelling uh, relationship uh, between a particular gene that to this day has never been associated with a particular disease. And we see, for example, um, you might look at gene X and and you, you find through the kind of large population-based studies that we're doing that, that, uh, that a variant in that gene, which appears to cause, again, loss of function in that gene, that, that patients that have uh, a heterozygous loss of function, so just one copy loss of that gene, have about a half the risk of the rest of the population of having a, a, a spectrum of disorders, all of which have the underlying root cause being atherosclerosis, so stroke, heart attack, sudden death, peripheral vascular disease. And what you see there is that, you know, that's not being driven uh, largely by changes in LDL cholesterol in the blood. There's something else going on. 
And you know, that kind of thing is just amazing because when you look at gene X and you see the body of literature about that gene and, the, and its function, it has nothing to do with atherosclerosis. No one has ever thought about it as a modifiable, and, it, and again, here's something where the loss of function variant protects from this disease. So you know, you're probably gonna need to make an inactivating drug, a drug that inactivates that gene product we're generally pretty good at doing that in the industry. So immediately, you know, you have something in your hands which is extremely intriguing. But to the point that was made earlier, there's a lot of work to do still. Um, you may have taken time out of the front end of having spent a lot of time getting to a level of conviction where you would actually begin to try to drug that target by developing, let's say, a monoclonal antibody against that target if it's on the cell surface. So you've saved some time up front, but you also don't have any of the biologic mechanistic understanding. Mm -hmm. And you have to develop that now in parallel with driving that antibody forward to get it into patients. You're going to have to do a cardiovascular outcomes trial. And by the time you get around to doing that, you better have some idea what's going on with the biology, right? So mm -hmm. it's a paradigm shift. And we've, we've had to live through at Amgen over the last couple years two paradigms. Now, we have the, the old paradigm that I described to you before. And now we got this new paradigm where these things come out of the blue. And you, you have to believe in them because they come from human genetics. And yet at the same time, you know, the, the, the biology that has to be worked out um, has to be done in a very different way. And sometimes these targets are not readily druggable, and so you have to work out the biochemical pathway and find another spot in that pathway to drug the pathway. So, you know, but there, you know, the power of this approach, I mean, we have two programs right now in late stage development, you know, PCSK9 inhibition right. for cholesterol, sclerostin inhibition for bone density for osteoporosis. These are the two biggest investments we are making as a company. Between the two of them, I think we're probably in at a level of around five to six billion dollars of investment after 10 to 15 years of work. And the reason we're willing to do that, right, is because when we get the results from these outcome trials, when we actually see the reduction in cardiovascular events in the case of PCSK9, when we see the level of fracture resistance that women have um, in an outcomes trial, a fracture outcomes trial, mm -hmm. we're pretty confident in what we're going to see. And that's really for one reason, the human genetics. If you take away the human genetics from that equation, these are insane levels of risk. How, what are you investing in, in epigenetic therapies? We don't have a, a, a large focus in that area at Amgen. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we've, we've been focused on trying to move quickly into this historic opportunity to look at the actual DNA sequence mm -hmm. in the way that we've been discussing. In our cancer biology areas, there are some scientists who are working on it, uh, but it's not a major focus for us right now. Yeah. Uh, we've been talking a lot about all the extra biology you need to do to understand the pathway after you make the genetic discovery. But let's say you take the uh, protective variant that uh, David found for type 2 diabetes, or the protective variant that Kari has found for uh, Alzheimer's. What if Let's say you skip the biology, because the reason we're working out the biology is to try to figure out, okay, is there a small molecule or a large molecule that can fit in and we can manipulate and, uh, and uh, do something, have, have an effect on, on the disease. What if, in the future, if you could change an Alzheimer patient's genome in, you know, a certain number of neurons, okay, let's just say in the future here, you know, if CRISPR ever works out or some, some other technology, and change every neuron to have the protective variant that's found in Iceland and found very not, not many other places, it's very, very rare, right? But it's predicted to decrease your progression and risk for Alzheimer's sevenfold. Would we be willing to make that change, you know, assuming there's no off-target off other, other effects, right, without working out all the biology? And with that short circuit, the timing, when it comes to this. Now, of course, we're thinking science fiction, right? But just imagine if you could deliver that change that single change that's protective, right, and you have the population data that suggests that that's the effect it will have on type 2 diabetes or Alzheimer's, would you do it? You know, 
your question about having a rocket ship go out into space. I know you've seen the debate recently. Most scientists now think that's a really bad idea <laughs> <laughs> because the guys that are out there, once they realize we're here, yeah. may not be so friendly. <laughs> uh, yeah, and for me, that what, but you ask what lights me up, it's always when I, the individual patient. So, what, you know, someone says, that patient, that 19 year old we just had who had a glioblastoma, you know, we thought they, we know the pathway. We hoped they, the kid would respond. And then when the tumor went away, I mean, there's no better feeling in what we do. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, that when the history books get written, I think that they will say, as, as Sean said, we are living through a his, an historic transformation, in the, I think, in the understanding of human disease, not these five years. But I think if you go back, just to focus on genetics, because it's the topic of the panel, to 1980, when the first sort of description of how you would use the classical fly genetics to do human genetics. And now we're 35 years later. It was actually just 10 or 15 years until 1,000 Mendelian diseases were understood. Up until 10 years ago, the idea that we could understand the genetic basis of common complex diseases was written about often as an impossible task. When I actually yeah. left uh, at my training at Mass General to go work on that problem, I was told by almost everybody, but not one person, the chief of medicine, that, me. I, in, that it was a mistake <laughs> to go work on, and you may still agree, that it was a mistake <laughs> to work on complex diseases. But there's no doubt that we're making progress now, even beginning to pill apart the, much, the PCSK9 example. That's a common complex disease in which a particular target was identified. So I think that there's one historic change that we are living through. It's a 50-year change of really understanding the underlying base of human disease. What really excites me is actually these examples beginning to occur that we can actually now make therapeutic advances based on that. You put those two things together, mm -hmm. and I think that it's not next year, it's not five years from now, but 25 to 50 years from now, I do think that there will be new medicines. I think it will actually look like the old medicine. I don't think everyone will be staring at their iPhone all the time. I think it will look pretty much like the old medicine, except that like heart attack rates, which are, which are down 50%, we will simply see that we have actually made much more progress than we had in the past mm -hmm. in preventing and treating these difficult diseases. Without give, do, giving away information that will affect share price, <laughs> can you give us a little insight, Mark and Sean, into what's going on behind the closed doors in terms of future uh, development, in terms of what's needed, of what you see as a possible exciting development, or and, I, and as I keep asking over and over again, because I'm, I'm I'm relentless on this issue of what are the unforeseen consequences, and you know what are things that are that we're just not thinking. Of? It's hard to ask somebody what are the things you're not thinking about, right? Because like you're in a loop. But do you do you have other people come in and say, wait a second? You're not thinking about this. You know, is there a person who's hired just to do that? You know, um, asking a lot of questions. Well, but. scientists. You know, I mean, we have large numbers of scientists in our organizations, and they are by nature very skeptical, and uh, they tend to engage in a lot of peer review of one another's work. Um, and so, I think you get a lot of uh, red teaming. You know, of of mm -hmm. things. Um, we try to make sure that we are. Uh, we have a very open scientific environment like the one you find in academic environments where people are not afraid to say, hey, you know, have you thought about, you know, the safety considerations here uh, of doing, making that intervention? Um, you know, I, I, I think um, it, what we often are worried about um, is, as you mentioned, is, is the, uh, the untoward effects of what we're doing. And, and we sometimes believe that we have a good understanding of what, what, what to do. Uh, and we, we find out that that part was right, but we were looking at too narrow an aperture. And when, we, when you broadened out, you're hitting uh, that target or an off-target toxicity in another organ system. And that has an effect which is, takes away, you know, uh, uh, alters your risk benefit in a way that's, that's, that's unpleasant. And, and that does happen. I mean, one of, the, one of the powerful things, again, about the population genetics was true with PCSK9, for example, it was possible not only to look to see that people with these mutations had 88% lower rate of heart attack, mm -hmm. but they also had normal all-cause mortality. And there was no evidence right. that they had cancer or other disorders at higher rates. Now, 
you need a decent population of people with an allele frequency has to be high enough where you can get enough patients to study to get that confidence. That's not always possible. Sometimes you're looking at very small populations of people who have these mutations and you can be sure about the, the effect on the efficacy side, but you basically have no assurance from a safety perspective because there's just too few of these people can to look at. Can you tell us what's on the drawing board? Well, um, you know, I mean, as, as is the case, I'm sure, with, with, with Mark and David, there, that we've got a lot going on. Uh, we have to be thinking about things that are going to come to the market in 12, 15 years. Um, right now, the, the hottest areas for us are what we've been talking about, the, the opportunistic discoveries that occur uh, due to the human genetics research and the field of, uh, of, of immuno-oncology, where we're turning the immune system uh, on to attack uh, tumors. And that's right. not a neuroscience topic, but it certainly is something that is a sea change in science and medicine that is akin in the oncology area to, in non-oncology, the impact of modern population genetics on impacting, again, our ability to really make a difference. Um, durable effects on, on patients who are, you know, surviving for much, much longer periods than they would without these interventions. I, I think those are the hottest areas for us right now. And are the gen are, is genetics involved in the, in the modula immuno um, modulation it, it, of cancer? Not the same kind of genetics that we've been talking about, but, but absolutely, um, you know, we recently had a product approved um, where we're, we've engineered a very different approach to being able to take a patient's uh, T cells and, and direct them to destroy cancer cells. Right. And that particular protein construct that does that is, is of course, like many things we do, a highly genetically engineered um, process that starts in a genetically engineered mouse and goes through right. and it's produced in cells, in human mammalian cells. And so, you know, the, the, the manipulation of genetics in, 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 in our world has become, uh, you know, routine in, 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 in terms of being able to develop breakthrough medicines We've of that We've covered sort. a couple of those, those stories. It's fascinating. Basically, the equivalent of, of taking the scent of the cancer, giving it to the bloodhound, which is, you know, your immune cells taken outside yeah. of the body, maybe some dendritic cells, yeah. maybe grow them up, bring them back in. I mean, that's... Yeah. No, and it's a I concept that's, that's been around for, you know, hundreds of years because of the occasional association between immunizations for smallpox and so on, with people getting, or cowpox, get, getting respond, you know, suddenly being cured of tumors. And, and yet it's only very recently, very recently, again, the same kind of time scale we're talking about of this uh, ability to sequence large numbers of people where we've actually seen success. We've seen success with oncolytic viruses and so on. So that's a very exciting par uh, area of medicine right now. Mark, yeah. what's on the drawing board? Regenerative medicine. I think that the time, and this is very genetically tied, but in a different way, standard. And so I'm a developmental geneticist, so we worked out pathways, fruit flies, and zebrafish, and others. Those pathways now tell us how to change and capture cell fates so we can restore, we're doing a pretty good job, I think, so far, of restoring muscle strength first in some rare diseases, and now hopefully in the sarcopenia of the elderly, which is the weakness that's so common. We have a cell fate gene that turns on cells in the ear to restore hearing, because you lose the hair cells uh, from too much ACDC. Uh, and, and, so, and, and these same principles can apply regeneration of the liver, they can apply in the eye. So we're quite interested in that. So that's one area. How about, in the brain? How about using that and stem cell therapies and, you know, for neurodegenerative diseases? Not just a, a chip in the retina, or, but I mean... Maybe. I don't know yet. I mean, that would be hard. The other, of course, which you're interested in is CRISPR. Uh, I'm uh, one of that group that's quite concerned now about the ethics of that. It has to be worked out. And that's going to be, a, you know, with a, that uh, paper that was uh, inappropriate that was published from China using modifying the human uh, zygote. And that's, you know, that should be verboten. Uh, and that's a problem. But otherwise, you know, there are real, real possibilities, yeah. as you were saying. Uh, so certainly ex vivo, I don't know about in vivo yet, but ex vivo. And that's going to be an evolution there. Um, 
There may be other ways of modifying genomes, too, and there may be ways of targeting RNA, which is an area we're very excited about, too. We have, uh, we're, we're very interested in spinal motor atrophy, which is our mm -hmm. RNA sp splicing disease and quite interested in whether we can now go in and actually use a low molecular weight chemical to fix splicing defects. We can in animals, whether we can in people, we don't know. So those are some of the areas I'm excited about. David? Yeah, no, I, I agree with what my colleagues have said. I mean, I think that um, first there was the era of small molecule therapeutics, then there was biotechnology and proteins, then antibiotic, you know, antibodies, each of these which were talked about for some period of time before they became reality. I think the era of being able to add to that armamentarium nucleic acid-based therapies without picking any particular one uh, so that we, because, you know, you sort of imagine there's certain things that are well done with small molecules, certain things that are well done with proteins. There will be another class of things that we're going to learn from genetics or otherwise that can be done with nucleic acid therapy. And again, if you sort of think of these two pieces coming together of the underlying knowledge of disease, and then some of them will not be classically druggable, and we build up the armamentarium so we have an approach to each one, mm -hmm. I think then we really begin to make rapid progress. Uh, I'm trying to get the audience involved again. Um, we can only find tolerable variants, hence human gen genetics can only find a small number. What are the other ways to find new targets? I think in some ways, I'll just try it and others may comment. The, the challenge is not actually to find all the targets. Mm -hmm. I think the challenge is actually to have ones that we have enough confidence in how they translate into the, into the families and the patients that we can invest the kind of resources needed to succeed in this. And so I think sometimes when the discussions go to, well, that approach will only find a subset of things, how do you find all the rest? At least when I look at the industry and I look at what people are doing, that's not actually the challenge is how do we get to every last one? It's how do we have enough in our pipelines that actually have that solid evidence base that we actually succeed at a high rate and make steady progress. Have you thought about just sort of what it might look like 10 years from now, a person walks into the doctor's office, what happens there based on the information that now we have? I remember Bert Vogelstein giving me this whole fantasy of you come in, there's a tricorder-like device, you, you know. <laughs> have you had those thoughts about what medicine might look like now, that we're going to have all this information, we're going to have, assuming we have the phenotypic uh, databases and the genotypic yeah, databases? The first thing you have to realize is it probably won't be in the hospital. It may be at your CVS, uh -huh. and you'll walk in, and of course you'll have your genomics done. And I hope you said uh, CVS and not CBS, because we are C not C set up. C in CVS any way or show. other or other pharmacy or whatever. <laughs> uh, uh, the, you know, and uh, then of course you'll, you know there'll be this panoply uh, with, with various proteomics as well, um, and there'll be I think a lot of phenotypic analysis that will be done there. The trick will be who's going to assemble those data. Who's going to put those together in a meaningful way? We can barely do it today, even within the realm of cancer biology. And that's, you know, and I don't know where that's going to sit, whether that will be in some mountaintop. Where does it in, live? In mountaintop, yeah. probably in California, um, which uh, will dictate. It's going to be very interesting. So the, I think the, and then what happens to you once you're diagnosed? Will you ever go see a physician, or will the physician be on a monitor? Will you be, uh, as you get aged, will, where will you be taken care of? Will you be, ever see a, a, a healthcare provider per se? Or, so those are the kinds of things we need right. to I agree. About. I agree with Mark wholeheartedly that for, there'll be big changes that aren't the tricorders. They're just like, where's the care delivered and by whom? But I think that the one thing that, that a plug, it's not actually where the data will live. I'm very confident that it will be federated. It'll be in many places. It's not going to be one. There might be some winners, but there'll be reasons that the data is in many places. I would say that the key question is, do we have an information ecosystem like we have for the internet? like we have for the World Wide Web and e-commerce, where transactions can be done. Mm -hmm. And I'll put a plug in for the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which uh, is uh, uh, you know, an organization trying not to dominate the information, not to collect all the information, but to make sure that we can have secure transactions so there can be sharing. Because if the information is siloed, mm -hmm. it will be like US electronic medical records. And we can look at how much we've learned from US electronic medical records, which is unfortunately not very much because they're all siloed. And to plug uh, us, uh, we we're trying to do this uh, very similar things. And of course, we work with, with David's group on, on uh, the uniform standards of uh, being able to share sure. data. But we've tried to also work out the architectural demands, sure. database uh, bases and 
uh, tools to allow you to share securely. So that's what our goal is to try to uh, link together major medical centers around the US, right? So that somebody who's trying to diagnose a rare disorder, they'll be able to connect the dots with other medical institutions as well. Well, not to be a dinosaur, but Mark, I hope you are utterly wrong about not seeing a doctor in Me person. Me too. <laughs> uh, and I think it is a great challenge, which we're going to completely handle in the 23 seconds we have left, about how you, what you do as the physician, as the practicing physician, with all this data, yep. with the computerization. There's a, there's a cartoon I urge you all to find on the New Yorker, which is a guy looking at a computer screen. The patient's over here, but he's looking at the computer screen, and he goes... I don't like the look of your cholesterol. The guy's got eight arrows through him. There's blood <laughs> pouring down. I don't like the look of your cholesterol. So at some point, I hope we never lose that. Yeah. Double zero. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, panel.